Matthew 17, the first eight verses. The King James text today reads, and I will put it up on the screen if I can get it here for you that are in the building today. There you go. King James text today reads, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic only Jesus. Hallelujah. Only Jesus. If you'll bow your heads with me this afternoon, let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Amen. Father, we love you so much. We're so grateful, Lord, for the presence of the Lord in spite of our feeble attempts at worship using pre-recorded music and all of this. Oh God, how I wish we had live musicians. How I wish we had people that loved God, wanted to worship the Lord, wanted to work for the Lord, wanted to be part of our vision, wanted to be part of what you were trying to do in this place. But Lord, we try, we do our best to worship you, to sing the songs of the Zion, to give you the glory, the honor that is due your name in response to your blessing in our lives and the gift of salvation for which we are so grateful, Lord. The Word of God is so necessary to our walk with God. It's bread for us. It's sustenance for us. It is, Lord, today that tool, that weapon which you've given us which allows us to push the enemy back as he tries to advance against us. It is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. The Word of God is so much for us today. And it is through the preached Word of God that our faith grows and multiplies and is increased. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If there is any preacher, Lord, today who understands the absolute essential need for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's this preacher. I've been preaching a long time, and there's not been one sermon that I've ever preached that I did not humble myself before you and ask you, God, to anoint me, to help me, to assist me, so that I might deliver the Word of God faithfully, carefully, Lord, in a manner that is pleasing in your sight, in a manner that will allow the people of God to receive it to the benefit of their soul. Master, anoint today my lips, anoint today the heart, the hearing of every hearer. 
Let this message, O oh God, inspire faith in our hearts. Let it allow us this hour, O oh God, to reach out and touch the hem of your garment that we might receive the salvation we need, the restoration that we need, the deliverance that we need, the healing today that we may need. Master, grant it today, for we best it in none other than that powerful, wonderful, redeeming name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Many of us are familiar with the story of <clears throat> the Lord's transfiguration. We've heard it, we've read it, we've heard it preached on throughout the course of our Christian journey, our Christian walk. And it is one instant, one moment in time when God's divinity literally just began to shine through the human veil that was the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness, what a wonderful thing. Here the Lord was come to earth to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets and to fulfill the law given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And if he was to complete his task, there was a moment apparently when it was necessary <coughs> for him to confer with his two servants, Moses, the author, the writer, I should say, of the law, and Elias or Elijah, the great prophet, I might add, Elijah is that prophet who did not experience death, but rather was translated to glory by way of a fiery chariot. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness, and here the Lord is conferring with both the dead and one who had never died. Hallelujah. A representative of the law and a representative of the prophets. I'm going to tell you this. I keep saying this over and over again. Oh, I wish people to understand the Bible is so much greater a document. It is so much greater a book than anything you could ever imagine in all your life. There are so many incredible things within the Word of God that... When you understand them, they will set your soul on fire. They will inspire your faith. They will cause you to believe God and trust God more than you've ever believed God and trusted God. Let me tell you, God doesn't never do nothing. I've said this I don't know how many times. God doesn't ever do anything by accident. Everything the Lord does. Everything the Lord does. Every single little thing the Lord does. There is a reason for it. There's a purpose. It serves a very important divine purpose. And there's a message in it. But you got to know it, and you got to see it, and you got to understand it. And that's why God calls men and women to preach the gospel and to help a lot of times. Because it's not that you couldn't see it if you, if you wanted to, or not if you couldn't see it if you had time to. You know, there's a reason why God doesn't want preachers working jobs. Has nothing to do with laziness, has nothing to do with making ministry into a profession. It has to do with the fact that my job is to help lead the people of God into a deeper walk with Him. That's my job. And to do that job, God wants me available 24-7 to Him. Not, not building something at a factory, not mowing something out, you know, on a field somewhere, not doing this or doing it. No, the Lord wants me available to Him in His service. I would, th this week I was going through files on my computer, and I was deleting hundreds upon hundreds, thousands even, of files of various... Oh, my goodness, flyers, posters, 
letters, emails, all kinds of projects that I've done over the last 20 years in Dallas, Texas on behalf of this church. Things that in the future uh, are not going to serve us. These are things that, you know, I, I really don't need to save them, so I'm trying to clear out room on my computer. Tommy, I was going through my computer and I'm deleting. 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 It started to hurt. Literally. My my heart started to ache. Because I thought, my God, this represents thousands of hours. Thousands of hours that I spent on behalf of this work in Dallas, Texas. Thousands of hours working on print shop program, putting together posters and flyers and putting together ad copy and doing all these, you know, different things. Um, putting together our worship programs. When I go through all our videos of all our, uh, all our hymns and all our courses, every single one of them I made. Every one of them. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. I know people who are starting churches and doing things who haven't got ten of these. And if you asked them to make one, they wouldn't know how to do it. I've got hundreds of these. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these PowerPoint presentations that I put together every Sunday to accompany my message. Tommy, I'm going through all these files and my heart started to ache because I'm deleting things that I spent thousands of hours working on. Tommy can tell you how much work I do for the church. Tommy can tell you how much of my time I'm on that computer and I'm doing something. I'm doing some kind of outreach. I'm doing some kind of uh, putting together some kind of ad copy. I'm doing some kind of designing. I'm laying this out. We've had bookstores. We've had thrift shops just so the church could have a place to worship. And then I devoted 40 hours or 60 hours a week to that endeavor so that we could just afford to pay for a meeting space. Because I felt like people would be more inclined to come check out our church and maybe join and become part of our work if we had a nice meeting place. So instead of meeting at the house, you know, I was trying to provide us with a decent meeting place. And I worked my backside off for hours and hours a week to try to have a meeting place, didn't I? Mm -hmm. For the church. And I'm looking at all these thousands of hours. There's a reason why God doesn't want His ministers working secularly. There's a reason why. The best way I can usher you into the presence of God, which is also part of my job, best way I can help usher the people of God into the presence of God, the best way I can help usher people of God into a deeper understanding of His Word and a deeper knowledge of the things of God, the best way I can do that is if I devote all of my energy and all of my time into that endeavor. Am I telling the truth? I know I am. So, oh, preacher, you don't all you do is come to church and you start singing and stuff and, and, and you lead a worship service. Oh, honey, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. I'm worshiping God all week long. Ask Tommy. Ask him about us driving up to Oklahoma and being in the car for three or four hours. Ask him how much worship I do. Ask him how much singing I do. If you think my worshiping God is something that only happens on Sunday afternoon, oh, you don't know me very well. No, I'm in the presence of the Lord 
all through the week while you're at work working I'm in the presence of the Lord while you're sitting at home watching your television I'm in the presence of the Lord while you're going to the clubs hanging out I'm in the presence of the Lord while you're hooking up and cruising I'm in the presence of the Lord while you're out there drinking I'm in the presence of the Lord why because I need to spend as much time there as I can so that when it comes time to lead you there hello now it's a short trip because I just came from there. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And there are such wonderful truths that are so powerful and so wonderful in the Word of God that they will blow your mind. But I've known preachers that work jobs. And I'm going to tell you something. I, the pastor who baptized me in Jesus' name, that poor man worked third shift at a job. He was a dental uh, technician. He made things like dentures and partials and plates and what have you. And that man could preach you into a coma. I mean, I, I God forgive me. I, I'm being honest, I really am. He was the most boring, tedious, hideous preacher I've ever heard in my life. He used to drive me insane trying to listen to him. He was terrible. But you know what? Why don't you try to preach after work at 11 to 7? Monday through Friday, right? Why don't you try to get up there and preach and do a good job? when you're so tired all the time because not only do you work 11 to 7 but then you come home half the time and there's somebody from the church who's sick or somebody whose loved one is sick and you've got to go to the hospital to see them and you've got to lead a Wednesday night Bible study and you've got to be there for various things and you know uh, when you need sleep you're not getting it do you follow what I'm telling you today? That poor man, I understood why he was so boring. I really did. It was sad, but he worked, you know, and, and he was constantly in a state of exhaustion. There are people who seem to think that they're perfectly within their right to expect men and women of God to go out and work and earn a living, and that preaching, oh, that's just a little part-time thing they do. You're an idiot. That's not what ministry is about by any stretch of the imagination. Matter of fact, you're so far off base, it's not even funny. I want to tell you, there's some wonderful truths, and they're going to come out today if I can shut up and get around to them. Amen. <laughs> the transfiguration, the divinity of Christ shines through His human flesh. And the apostles who had accompanied him, Peter, James, and John, to his private prayer meeting. I'm going to tell you, you better be careful who you invite to pray with you. There are some people who don't know how to pray. There are some people who pray, but they don't know how to really exercise faith and believe God for anything. There are people we've had in this church who constantly were begging me, oh, we need to have a prayer meeting, we need to have a prayer meeting. And I knew that the only people would probably show up for that prayer meeting were going to be me and that person. And guess what? I had no confidence in that person's praying whatsoever. I didn't enjoy praying with them. I didn't like praying with them. Matter of fact, to be honest, I completely disliked praying with them. We could be on opposite ends of the room praying, and all I'd hear is all these, whoa, 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 whoa is me. Whoa, 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 Lord. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This individual didn't know how to pray, literally. All this person knew how to do was lament. Lamentation is not prayer. It, I'm not talking about intercession, because if he'd have known how to intercede, I'd been happy with that. He didn't know how to intercede. Everything was literally just, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm hearing it just drove me up the wall. So every time he'd come saying, Oh, we need that prayer meeting, we need that prayer meeting, I'd think, well, if it's going to be just me and you, no, thank you, I'll pass. I used to love to pray with Sister Chambers. She's in her 80s. 
My God, seeing I'd get to praying and my Lord, the Holy Ghost had come down, we'd have a Holy Ghost inspired camp meeting. Just she and I praying in her living room. I'm going to tell you, be careful who you pray with. Jesus was careful. He had 12 disciples and yet whenever he wanted to kind of break away from the crowd and kind of go off by himself, you'll notice that he always seemed to take the same three. Peter, James, and John. You ever notice that? So you see, you wonder why the pastor tends to have what some people would say, oh, he's got favorites. Oh, he hasn't got favorites. It's not about them being favorites. But that's kind of the inner circle. You know, those are the people that maybe he has greater confidence in. Those are the people he likes to pray with. Those are the people he likes to be around. Maybe they keep a better attitude. Maybe they have a better spirit. Maybe they're more positive and faith-filled than the rest of the crowd. Hello now. The Lord went off with Peter, James, and John, and he was transfigured. He literally, literally manifested his divine nature. Peter, as Peter so often was inclined to do, <laughs> Peter was one who always opened his mouth first and thought about it later, if he thought about it at all. Peter sees this. He sees Elijah. He sees Moses. He sees the Lord transfigured. And he decides, oh Lord, probably the thing that would make you the happiest is if we built three tabernacles here. Basically, in other words, what he was saying was, if we pitch three tents, these tents in a, in a sense represent a, a meeting place or the church as it were. Tabernacle literally means a mobile place of worship. So he said, oh, we ought to put pitch three tents, one for Elijah, one for Moses, one for you, Lord. Yeah, that, that's what the Lord likes to do. God likes to share his glory with men. Hello now. That wasn't a very smart thing for Peter to say. But what's interesting is, as they fall into a state of slumber, Peter, James, and John. All of this, I'm sure, was far too much for them to take in. The Lord comes over and He touches them and He says, Guys, guys, hey, hey. And they open their eyes and they look up and the Word of God says, All they saw, there was no other man present. There was no Elijah, hallelujah. There was no Moses, hallelujah. There was only Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, my friend, there are many Christians in our world today who struggle with understanding the role that is played by the law and the prophets as they relate to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you today, when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, and the dust has cleared, you're going to find out that it's all about Jesus only. The only thing you need, the only thing that's necessary is Jesus. Hallelujah. You don't need the law. Hallelujah. You don't need the prophets. You need Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. When it's all sin and done, the law is dead. Glory to God. The prophecies yet live. I've told you you're going to get some you're going to get some imagery from this that you didn't anticipate. The law is dead. Moses died. Elijah didn't. <laughs> because the prophecies are not yet all fulfilled. So therefore, the prophets are still living. The prophets are the prophecies still live. Am I telling the truth? But the law is dead. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, uh, wait, I better put on my glasses. I might steer you wrong. 
Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. This is why he had to have a little meeting with Moses and Elijah. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall excel the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. In Romans chapter 8 verses 2 through 4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Listen. Hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law, listen, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He said, the righteousness that the law was trying to help God's people find would not be fulfilled in them through the law because the law couldn't do it. So Jesus came so that he might condemn sin in the flesh and in so doing, he could fulfill the law so that the law now could be put to rest and we now could walk after the Spirit and we could walk in the righteousness that the law was trying to help people find. But they couldn't. Because why? Because they were trying to find it through the flesh. They were trying to find it through their actions, through their deeds, through not doing this and not doing that, through doing this and doing that. It was all about what they did and did not do. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And Paul said, no, no, no. The true righteousness that the law was trying to help them find is the righteousness that comes by faith. And walking in the Spirit has nothing to do with your deeds and your actions. It has nothing to do with following a bunch of rules. It has nothing to do with trying to live up to certain edicts and certain regulations and certain requirements. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? said, but see now the righteousness that the law was trying to help people find is now fulfilled in us. <laughs> said, we've actually achieved it. Wow, didn't Jesus say, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? Isn't that what he just said in our previous text? Amen. It has exceeded, but it's because we are not pursuing righteousness that is attained through the deeds of the flesh, but rather we have attained a righteousness that is accomplished through faith in His righteousness. And for that reason, God shares the righteousness of Christ with us. He clothes us in the righteousness of Christ. So that as sinful and imperfect and unholy and ungodly as we are, God still sees us as perfect. 
because he never looks at us in terms of what we are today. He always looks in terms at us in terms of what he is going to make us tomorrow. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. In Romans, uh, excuse me, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 4 and 5. And the Lord said unto him, meaning Moses, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. God had brought Moses to a high place, just outside the promised land. For 40 years, Moses had been leading the children of Israel through the wilderness toward the land of promise. And finally, they were standing at the border of this land. And the Word of God said the Lord brought Moses up to this mountain. And He caused him to look and He said, Look, Moses, look. As far as your eye can see in this direction, as far as your eye can see in that direction, as far as your eye can see. He said, this is the land that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. This is the goal. This is the destination that you've been walking toward for the last 40 years. Moses, I know there's nothing you'd love more than leading the parade as the children of Israel marched into that land of promise. But now, it's time for you to rest. The Word of God, listen. Listen to what it tells us. This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have ceased caused thee to see it with thine eyes. This is what God said to Moses. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes. But thou shalt not go over thither. He says you see it, but you won't get to go in. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Mm. Moses led God's people. That's what I'm afraid of sometimes. I feel like, God, am I going to spend my whole life struggling to minister to a bunch of unthankful, rebellious people? And then when they finally get anywhere close to where they need to go, you're going to take me home. That's what it feels like sometimes. But there was a reason for this. There was a reason for this. I told you, God does nothing by accident. For what the law could not do. Oh, glory to God. Remember, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, <laughs> God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh condemns sin in the flesh. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Moses is a representative of the law. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses was there with Jesus as a representative of the law. Oh, God have mercy. I'm going to get so happy. The law was dead. <laughs> the law giver was dead. The man who wrote the law was dead. The representative of the law was dead. The one who wrote the law could not lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Now listen to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, 
the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, or toward where the sun sets, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. <laughs> oh, children, listen to me. <laughs> Moses represented the law. You ask any Jew today, and they'll tell you it is the law of Moses. He was the one that God used. He is considered a prophet. Moses, as a matter of fact, is considered by the Jews to be the greatest prophet they ever had because God used him to convey the law to them. But see, the law <laughs> could only get them so far then the law had to die. And then guess who stepped in to lead them through? Oh, just this man named Joshua. Just, <laughs> just a fellow named Joshua. Just a man whose Hebrew name is Yeshua. Just a man whose Hebrew name means Jehovah, our salvation. Or Jehovah has become salvation. Just Joshua. Joshua is the one who led them in. The law could only get them so far. But it took Joshua to lead them in. Oh honey, let me tell you a little secret. The name Joshua is the Old Testament Hebrew name for the New Testament man Jesus. Hallelujah. The name Joshua is the same as Jesus. Jesus and Joshua had the same name. Glory to God. What the Jesus could, hallelujah. The law couldn't get the people into the promised land, but Jesus could glory. Well, hallelujah. That's why when it's all said and done, it's not about Moses. It's not about Elijah. It's only Jesus, hallelujah. Woo! Glory. My God have mercy. What the law could not do. Could not do. Jesus did. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh my Lord. Believe it or not, I'm almost done. Romans 7, 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren... For I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Yeah, we got folks so worried about gay people, but they don't think nothing about divorce and remarriage. Got news for you, honey. 
over and over. Even Jesus talked about it. And over and over and over again, they made it abundantly clear that according to God's law, there is no allowance for remarriage. You are permitted, if you're in a relationship with a cheating spouse, you are permitted to divorce that spouse. However, you cannot remarry as long as that spouse is alive. Period. That's what God's law said. As long as your former spouse is still living, you cannot remarry. You're still bound by the law, by the law of Moses. You're still bound to that spouse. Whether you are divorced in this life and in this world or not, if you're divorced from them in this world, then fine. Go on and live your life. You don't have to live with that person. But you cannot remarry until that former spouse is dead. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about what the law said concerning divorce and divorce and remarriage. But he's using this as an allegory. He's using this to help demonstrate and explain a very important spiritual principle. Listen. So then if while her husband liveth, or her ex-husband in this case, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So it's considered adultery if you're divorced and you then turn around and marry someone else. Though she be married to another man. So even though she's married to the other man, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, she is still called an adulteress. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also, listen, are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. If you ever wanted to know whether or not Jesus was God, here is the answer. Here it is nice and tidy. The same one who died caused us to be free from our commitment and our marriage to the law. Why? Because he was the lawgiver. Had to be. He had to be the one we were married to first. Oh my goodness. He had to be our first marriage. He had to be our first husband. Who was the first husband? The law. Who was the author of the law? God. What is the word of God called Jesus? The author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, wait a minute. I thought God's the one who put all this together from the beginning of time. I thought God was the one who had this all figured out and he had a plan before time even began. I thought God was the author of our faith. God is the author of our faith. <laughs> but listen to this. The Lord died so that we then could be free from the law of Moses but then he rose again so that now we could be married to him. Hallelujah. Now we could be married to him. Why? Because what the law could not do. Oh my God. Jesus did. Oh glory to God. The law could not bring us to that place where we could be married to Him. It could not bring us to that place where we could be joined to Him. It could not bring us to that place where we could become the bride of Christ. But Jesus came and did it. And in so doing, Moses died without going into the promised land and Jesus led the rest of the way. Oh, hallelujah to God. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law of the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Oh, my goodness. What's this gospel about? Who's the focal point of this wonderful gospel? I'm going to tell you, it's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. I'm going to tell you, you poor Jehovah's Witnesses, you don't know how blind you are. You don't know how much you're missing. The devil has you deceived into denying every good thing about the Lord Jesus Christ there is to profess. Every truth there is to profess, you deny. And you don't get it. Because this whole thing is about only Jesus. Hallelujah. When the dust has settled, when the smoke has cleared, when Moses and Elijah are no longer in the room, there's only Jesus. Hallelujah. Because what the law couldn't do, God Himself came to do in the person of the man Jesus so that he might have a bride, so that he might have an eternal love interest. Hallelujah. And the Apostle Paul said, we are, we are the righteousness that they saw after. We have found the righteousness that those who followed after the law were striving for. We found it. Because it's not about works. It's not about the works of the flesh. It's not about the works of the law. It's about faith. Hallelujah. And faith is what we otherwise call walking in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Children today, it's only Jesus. Glory.